Um, oh, Denise, do you want to bring in um, our yes, guest? I sure do. Can I introduce to our studio Nana Adjaman, part of Access UK? Nana? Hey! What's happening? You okay? Really good, really good, really good, and glad to you're here. And the reason why he's here is because in the one of the Thank groups um, he manages, sorry, can you hear me? One of the groups that he manages, Nana, as always, as long as I've known him, has has had hey, often, loud and clear. Yeah, good. Has always had stabbings, yeah, knife crime as one of the things high on his agenda. And what I like about him, why I like him, because he stuck with it but he's always looking for solutions. So I thought it would be a really good idea, and I hope we've got a lot of people in the chat who can, we can talk about solutions and see what things we can give to Nana so that Nana can take it away. So he'll explain what he's doing and why. You can, good, good, good. good. Yep, 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 can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, I can hear you, I can hear you. So before we start, before we start with you, a voice in my head, have you got some images of the case? Because this will lead into quite nicely when we just have our full discussion with Nana. Have you got the uh, the young man, the Bajan guy, Thorell Thompson? Images. Right, okay. So this is a picture. Do you know about Thorell Thompson, Nana? Yes, you do. We do I don't yeah. You do? do I? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the young man that came from Barbados just a couple of weeks ago. It was in your it was in the chat. So he came from Barbados. He'd been in a motorbike accident in a, in Barbados and he came over for a break to spend time with his family in Reading. He'd only been in the country for three days and he went into a pub in Reading, the walkabout sports bar in Reading, and the young man was stabbed in his head with a knife. Wow. Yeah. He's in. I haven't actually, I've actually missed, I missed this one. But go okay. ahead, I'm listening. I'm listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he'd, he'd only been here for four days when this happened. He'd been out with his family on a night out. Yeah. And this is what happened to him. So this guy, he's a lighting technician, 29 years old, well respected in his country, comes here on vacation, goes to this club, pub club, and whilst on the dance floor, this, this thing happened to him. His mother has had to fly over from Barbados to spend time with him. Now he's in an induced coma in the John Ratcliffe Hospital in Oxford. And basically the, the sad thing about it is that he had no insurance. So, you know, you know, we don't need to say no more. He had no insurance. So you know that emergency care he's entitled to, which he's got, we've got the emergency care, but anything else they do now, they want they want money. Yeah, they want money. So a GoFund was started. And I have to say the response was quite good. So up to that point, I think it was I think there was eleven thousand pounds was what they were told that he needed. When we last checked, there was eight thousand. But some community groups have been out there doing their thing. But guess what? They got to eleven thousand, then they got to twenty thousand. So this is only in the past few days. And then guess what's happened? They've told them it's 150,000 bill. 150,000. So I spoke to his mum this morning and she said that, um, oh, Courtney, oh, Quincy's back. She said that she's got, um, you know, she's got lots of support and she really appreciated the fact that people are trying to put money in, but it's gone through the roof. £150,000 is now required to support this young man. He's, he's got no cover on his skull at the moment. Yeah. And that's a big operation that's going to be required. And then eventually he will have to be sent home. So there is no money at all. So we've currently got 20000 Big up to the groups that have been supporting. There have been community groups. There's been all sorts of bits and bobs have been going on. Um, I try to I'm trying to get us to do some media things for them so that it gets out there more. Yeah. So when you look for him, Thorell Thompson, you will find bits and bobs in the news, but it's not like a big story. And it's a knife crime. So this is why it was appropriate for you to come on so we can have these conversations. And also, and Quincy later will be talking about. So we've got the knife crime situation. But what is the real effect on the families after that? Because when I spoke to her, she's struggling 
the woman is struggling because she cannot take that this has happened to her child. What is the impact? What's the what aftercare is there for people? So that's that. So now you know we're back. I want to talk to you about knife crime. Yeah. So would you want to tell mm. people if you could start by telling people who you are and what you do? That would be great. Okay, so my name is Nana, and I'm the co-founder and director of an organization called Access UK. It stands for African Caribbean Careers and Employment Support Services in the UK. Uh, we were set up in 2012 after the, Lon the London riots, just basically to give young black people um, better career services that's more aligned with their challenges, providing solutions that are bespoke for them uh, so we help basically young black people into education, employment, and enterprise, which is business startup. So that's what we are. We're a careers provider that's, that's um, structured to to support young black people in society and in in the labour market as a whole. So that's us. Okay, Quincy. Hello, Nana. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing, my friend? You you good? I'm good, I'm good. It's a, a fun call long, long overdue because I do want to have this discussion today um, regarding um, my friend and, and I'm open to have the conversation because this this does, it does involve the impact of how um, we, we, we see knife crime and how it's dealt with and, 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 and the right energy going to the, the correct people or if there's such a word as the correct organisations so to speak. So listening to the story which Denise brought highlight to me and it just shows us that I remember seeing that particular story but you know when you get a paper on the metro you're just flicking through. Flicking. So this story missed me. So it's only because of, of the Cajun groups and in Denise bringing up, I saw it even more. Um, and it's uh, just hearing the fact of Denise now telling us that it's £150,000. So Part of me, and it might be cynical thinking, part of me thinking the uh, people who do these operations who are involved around this, they might think they've got this money quick um, so they can afford more. And it, and, it, it, and it really highlights how a price is put on human life. And, and it really highlights where we're at as a community financially is the fact of it ain't like we ain't got um, people of colour with money. It's how they distribute that money and how it's looked upon in organisations. And we are, we, 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 we're we going to do everything within our power to try and raise that money for this young man. But the fact is, the simple thing about it, he's not the only one. There are plenty of families who need financial support. There are plenty of families who need that aftercare, not just for the, the, the victim, but the, the 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 supporting family. So, like even the, the the young lady in Croydon whose life was taken, like what support is that, that mother might have had to give up work to be there for loved ones or, or other people. So, what support has she got to pay her bills? To that woman should never ever need to work again. You understand what I'm saying? She should be looked after. So, so yeah. So this is that's, that's what I've picked up from this one particular case, I want to give you a story which I was sent to me by a, a, a comic who, who filmed this. I, I'll give that in, in a moment, yeah, but the, the Access, Access, your organisation, is it privately funded? Do you get funding? Do you, what, what, how, did you, how do you go about getting your money to help these people? That's a good question. When we started it in 2012, um, I funded it out of my own pocket. So uh, at the time we were, well, at the time I was I was doing a lot of, um, I was involved with property investment, you know, a lot of that stuff. Um, Mark was killed and like obviously connecting up with, with, with my people in Tottenham was like, I saw from the inside that the services that were out there, the mainstream were not structured to deal with the issues that I was hearing, I was hearing about. So I thought, you know what? Um, I, I, I basically sold one of my properties. I tried to remortgage, it didn't work at the time because that was the, the time of the credit crunch. So I tried to do a remortgage, it didn't work. 
end up selling it and it basically invested some of the proceeds into setting up access. So like you alluded to in what you said earlier, I'm a person that's concerned about our community. So I took the, I took the, the, the risk and uh, invested, invested it into access. So access, we're set up basically as a social enterprise and a charity or a business and a charity mixed up together. So we draw down on some of our money from services we deliver and get paid for, and other stuff is from grants and donations. But we're more kind of, we lean more towards the business side, which doesn't mean that we charge our beneficiaries to access our service. It's all free. Anybody that comes to our service is free, but somebody else is paying for that engagement. So for example, it could be the council, paying us to engage local people, or local youth. So that's how, that's how we're structured. That's, that's our basic structure. How does it make you feel then when um, you see campaigns to ban zombie knives? Um, the recent Idris Elba campaign um, and it's highlighted and, and then it seems to be put down. And on the mainstream, it seems to be Right, this is the news now, then we're just going to leave it because that was big news last month or in March, uh, at January. So, when you see things like that, how does that make you feel as an organization? Well, you know what? It's, it's again, it's a, bit, it's a bit of a loaded one. There's different kind of elements to that question. Um, <laughs> first of all, the reason why it's been, it's been in the news, it's been in news of late is because. Since the start of the year, most of the, well, the, 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 the victims that were highlighted in the media were all white victims. Okay? And I don't know if you've been observing how the media's been treating these white victims, a lot different from how they treat black victims. So you have, for example, in Nottingham, you had the, um, yeah. the three individuals that were killed. There was an older man, there was a young lady who was a student, and a younger white guy that were killed by a black um, first with mental health issues. There was a young, there was a young man that was killed in Primrose Hill on New Year's Day. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. you know Primrose Hill. Primrose Hill is quite, quite an affluent area in Camden, right around the borough of Camden. So he was he was killed by two white individuals in the park. And then there was there was another. Obviously, we know about Brianna. Is it Brianna Gay? Mm -hmm. um, the, the the transgender. Um, young lady that was that was killed as well by two again two 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 white young 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 people but like i said those those cases we see how the media treated it in terms of you know the parents going to the number 10 parents going to see keir starmer uh, um, they, they're looking to bring in new laws off the back of that it reminds me of the ben Kinsella case many years ago so what you see is the clear recognition that or inference that black, uh, sorry, white lives matter, black lives don't. Okay, it's, it's, it's obvious, it's obvious as day. Um, so that's the reason why Idris's campaign was given a lot of um, a lot of attention, because we're now seeing things that I've been saying for years. Because let's face it, knife crime is 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 framed as a black problem, as an exclusively black problem. Right, and that's the reason why nothing's been done about it because those that are those that are in, in the Joe public has been being pumped with um, misinformation and distortions of the facts, so that that perception is there in the wider community. There's people even in our community that think that knife crime is an exclusively black problem. So that's the that's the under that's the undercurrent of the reason why nothing gets done because who cares about black people? You know, that's essentially what it is, and. The evidence for what I'm saying is 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 is, is clear in terms of how these uh, high profile cases have been dealt with by the media and by the government. Um, it's evident. It's not even something to even discuss. But I've been saying this for years. I've been saying, listen, this is not a black and white issue. This is impacting on all communities. Let's come together and clamp down on a common problem. This is what I've been saying on, on the BBC, ITV for years. But obviously, I'm, a, I'm an anomaly in a, in, in a space because you didn't get black people going on TV, chatting up a load of nonsense um, and, and making the situation worse instead of better. So 
in terms of what Idris is doing, I think it's great. I think it's 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 um is a is a is a step in the right direction, but it's not by all means a solution. You know, it's that you know, banning banning zombie lives is not gonna address the mindset that drives that behavior in the first place. Do you understand? It's a behavior, it's the mindset that we need to we need to address. Because you know, you, you can ban things. You know, alcohol was banned in prohibition. It didn't stop people from from drinking alcohol, drinking and gambling. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. You know, what I mean, I've had conversations. I've joined groups. I've come out of groups because ultimately, the, 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 you can ban. Um, as far, last time we checked, guns were banned, but people. Thought, <laughs> You know, what I mean? so, <laughs> so we've gone, we've we've gone from, we've gone from guns and trying to ban knives. You know, what I mean, which are going to ban, try and ban words on placards, but you know, what I mean, but ultimately it's the after effect of those because that particular policy change is not happening now, and no. uh, because that's, that's potentially going to happen in September, right? Yeah, and, and um, like I said last time we checked. People don't hold off until September. You know what I mean? <laughs> if anything, it will go up because say, look, let me get all my bookings in now because come September, I'm putting on pools. It doesn't work like that. Oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to bring in, I want to bring in another lady that I've, who I've worked with. Um, yeah. She's part of uh, her own organization. She's a mother and she's got young, young children. So she has dealt with young people who have been victims. And I had a conversation with her um, who literally, and now as she can tell you, it, it just opened my eyes. Us as adults, and we all in there as grown, grown people. I don't think I, I underestimate, and even have conversations with my own sons. We don't know the world they live in. Not at all. We just know that like, you're my child, daughter or, daughter or son. I should know what you do. I we don't understand what it's like to go from our house to the end of the street or to another area. What anxieties they or they have to put in. I've got to avoid this, that, go down this road. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. We haven't grown up in that. So can we bring no. her in, uh, Tarina? Um, in the building, Tarina in the building, just bring her in so we can have this conversation. Hi, Tarina. Good morning. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, Quincy. Good morning, Good morning, Nana. What's up? Are you okay? I haven't been okay. I haven't. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, about four weeks ago, almost four weeks ago, my 14 year old was stabbed. Wow. Um, it's that it's that phone call that no no mother ever wants to receive, and I've got to give all the glory to the most high that my son is alive and well, and he still has a future ahead of him. However, listening to the conversation, Nana, I totally agree with what you're saying. Quincy, you know how I feel about it. Um, not only am I a mum, but I've been working in the, you know, the caring sector, because as black people, that's what we do. We've got big hearts. And it's unfortunate that the rest of society don't really see how caring we are. They like to tarnish us and to tarnish everybody with the same brush. And that is not us. Ultimately, we, and that, I think that's part of our downfall, that we are so loving and giving and kind that we accept a lot of this nonsense. Um, as you know, I've grown up in this country. I've been born here. There was a major, major pandemic of knife crime in Scotland 20 years ago. They sorted that out. They sorted that out because it was a public health issue. They had to get on board NHS, social services, the police, all sectors were involved and they got rid of that problem. So if we're in London, we're part of the same country, they have the framework to do it. So why isn't it being done? Why isn't it being Absolutely. done? Absolutely. Can, can I just add, I, everything you said was spot on. Can I just add something to it? Up until 2019, because it wasn't that long ago, up until 2019, Scotland was a knife crime capital of Europe. Yes. 
not 20 years ago, up until 2019, statistically, mm-hmm. they were live crime uh, capital of Europe. So, you know, like I said, there's not, there's not a lot of people in Scotland that look like me and you in Scotland. So mm-hmm. we, 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 need, we need to get it out there. And the thing is, this data is there. Like you said, they're aware that it worked up there. The only difference, I think, with London, adopting in London is that we have to bring that cultural competency within it. Because obviously in, in Scotland, you're dealing with a certain demographic of people that live in Scotland. I think what, what we, we can, the, 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 see, they call it a public health approach, but what really is, is like a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with it. So you're working with, you know, the NHS, you're working with the police, you're working with this, you're working with that. We're all working in unison. That's really what a public health approach is. In layman's terms, is working with different partners at the same time to address the issue. So the, 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 everybody knows what everybody's doing and we're working in collaboration rather than working in isolation. That's the core uh, definition of a public health approach. The, the, like I said, the, the additional layer is that you're, you're living in a very, we're living in a very diverse capital. So that brings other yeah, nuances to the, to, to the same solution. That's, that's the only thing I'll add to that public health approach stuff. And, and to add on to that, and I think that we have to appreciate here in London, there's so much diff- diverse communities here. Everybody's going to have a different uh, attitude to knife crime. So in Scotland, it's still technically the same kind of cultures and backgrounds. So um, a, a, an elder is, is going to relate to the young person either through religion or football. But when you've got in London a mix of Somalian, a mix of West Indian, a mix of West African, you know what I mean? A mix of Eastern European, all under one roof, who ultimately live in areas with the only common denominator we have um, uh, amongst us is 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 finance, finances. Poverty. We are all is, is, is poverty. So that is yeah. the ultimate drive to why these things could happen, the, the potential root cause of what could happen. Um, again, I will pick up on what Nana says and... and, and um, um, and, and, and new to, to the point of, I do believe this is a black problem. This is only being spoken about because white be, white kids have been uh, affected of it. It's the same thing with the drugs. Um, f- uh, like I said, you couldn't tell black people about fentanyl 20 years ago. You know what I mean? But now, because we are, Dave Chappelle has highlighted it, and beginning of the year, um, unfortunately, no one wants no young person to be a victim of a knife crime. But because it is happening to white kids, this is why it's being highlighted. This is why. So, okay. Well, right. So I I have to be very careful with this. How I how I, well how I see it. I don't see this as just as a black problem. Yeah. I looked at Scotland, and they basically they went they it looked like they went to the root cause. They had everybody around the table. Where what seems to happen here? We have separations, we have silos of conversations. But what they did, they had everybody around the table. So the, gov- the, the government recognised somebody who came to a decision, that is going to be the only way that we're going to be, re- we're going to be able to resolve this with a five-year plan, yeah? <laughs> and that's what they did. Now, I appreciate there aren't many people that look like us, maybe in Scotland, but I think the ethos, the basis of what they did is what needs to happen here in the country and I, and I can't say I can't I'm not going to say it's a black problem because what happens is this you need to go to Liverpool your, your great city <laughs> you need to go to Liverpool you need to go to Manchester you need to go to Leeds let me say something this is happening to white there are white young men and not so much women that are being stabbed and yes you'll see it in the news but just like you're saying it was in the metro and it just it wasn't like a big thing but let me tell you, it is happening a lot more. And when I was doing stop and search, and I linked this because at that time, and of course, they were finding knives and that. You need, I remember those official statistics, the government statistics. And the fact is that the white people, yeah, were getting stopped and searched and guns and knives were found. Knives were found, but they did not necessarily appear in the stats. So we have a government, we have a media is presenting us and unfortunately people are believing Mm -hmm. it they are accepting it yeah it's just what black people do so i i personally have to be very careful 
I'm not going to go down that road because that then takes away what those white young boys are doing too. That's me. Uh, um, yeah, we're, 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 Denise, we're saying, that, we're saying exactly the same thing. What you just said there is not, doesn't differ from um, what I just said. Maybe I said it in a different way. It's exactly that. We need, we need to dispel these myths. Um, yeah. Remember I said, I said it's not an exclusively black problem. Do you understand? The, the, the media framed it. I've said this, I've said this on record so many times. Um, some people, some people on the BBC have been quiet when I've said it because you're looking at you're looking at elephant in the room. I'm saying what people think, but they're scared to say it. Right? Which is they framed it as a black problem, hence why no one cares. Even some black people don't care until it happens to their child or their some their family member, then then they, they start paying more attention. Um yeah. so so we're not we're not we're not we're not we're not we're saying exactly the same thing. You know, Glasgow, the reason why I mentioned Glasgow, sorry, Gla the, the, the Glasgow or Scotland as um, as the number one uh, na um, knife crime, the knife crime capital of Europe is because it's to emphasize that point, that mm. this is impacting, this is impacting on all communities, mm. you know, where, wherever you are, it's, it, it's everywhere. Yeah. You know, there, there's, a, there, there, there's an underbelly that's, that's it's going on everywhere yeah. so we need to we need to get away from the kind of divisive language that they have in the media the device stuff they put out there and come together and, and address a common problem yeah um, but the for years yeah mm -hmm. i think it also needs to be corrected because knife culture has been a part of youth culture from as long as we've known it so we've had in the uk you've had you know the craze, you've had the skinheads, you've had the mods, you've had all it's youth culture across the board. So we need to correct that narrative and let people know actually historically this has always been, and it's not just in the UK, it is yeah. actually it can be worldwide. It depends yeah. where you have find where you find the built up populations where they are affected by poverty and other socio economic um, issues. So yeah. we need to have um honest conversations where we're actually saying to people no come on look at the data and look at historic facts yeah you know it's not yeah. just and also we have to be honest and look at the culture of the music music breaks you know boundaries and i like to say we i've grown up in london it's it's a london thing it's it's not just a black cultural young people gravitate to the same kinds of music and if we're looking at what the music is um you know glamorizing it's that look at that young man that got um shot eight times the other day the way that the media reported that you'd think that he got shot once they downplayed that so we need to hold the media accountable because yeah. what they're doing is they're skewing things and it's yeah. wrong but yeah. that's just, just to say just just, we put, just just to say though that public health approach the reason why i think it's difficult quincy nana tiana I just think it's difficult because we have got a big issue with our police force. Yeah. Can you, I can't see them sitting around the table. Mark Rowley has got problems coming out of his ear hole right now with his own officers. And this is, you know, they're under special measures. Yeah. They're under mm -hmm. special. We mustn't forget that the police are under special measures. And basically they're not ready to sit around a table. So when Nan is looking for solutions, yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping that people do come in the chat and share some thoughts. I just think it, it's slightly harder for us because we're dealing with a, a, met, a police force that are just a bunch of wrongans. Mm. Uh, and I think um, to, to draw on that, when I say it's a black problem, um, I'm saying, yeah, we're in agreement. It's what the media has painted it out to be as a black issue. So when you listen to radio presenters on mainstream stations, um, and even in conversations I've been in on stage and stuff like that, they say this is a black issue. Um, and it isn't just a black issue, but it's looked upon as a black issue. It is when you mention Liverpool, again, the common denominator of the areas that's happening in Liverpool are poor areas. And and and, and as we know, Liverpool problems don't even see themselves as English. If you follow that like, the football team, they don't even see themselves as part of England because of how they've been treated. So for the next 20, 25 minutes, I do want to speak, and if we can, see, look, I mean, thank you for sharing with us that. And I mean, what what support have you got after the the news when you got that phone call? 
Like, what support have you got from not just family, but from the organisations to try to help you um, with your with your with your child? Unfortunately, not a lot. In fact, it's pretty much zero. I can I honestly need to big up St Giles, St Giles, and that's it really. Um, you see, social Giles. St Giles, they are like, um, they're an organisation that come into the hospital and they will support uh, anybody who's gone through a violent crime, any kind of trauma like that. So, for example, because my son is, he's adolescent, he's 14, um, they will come and have a conversation with him, put mentoring in place, um, support with his education, make sure that he's got somebody to talk to and some activities to do. Basically, that's it. The police, unfortunately, I've been the person that supported the police more than they're supporting me at the moment because I'm a person who's done um, youth work, detached work. I, Because my son was already in crisis, I was already hitting the road and befriending young people in the area. So a lot of the intel that I was able to pass to the police has come from the children. So because of that, and it's a safeguarding issue, I'm just like, I've pretty much gathered everything and given it to them. Otherwise, because I'm frightened for my child, the person who done that, the child who done that to my child, I can't have you on the road. I love you and I'm sorry that you're in the state that you're in and I'm, I forgive you, but I can't have you out on the road terrorising children because he's done it before. And because a young person that he attacked before was scared to testify, they dropped the case. So he was out and able to do it a second time. So what's going to happen? Are we going to leave him so that he can murder somebody before he gets put away? No, there should be things that should be able to be put in place, even though he's in um, on remand. What work is being done with him there? What psychological evaluations? Who's looking at his family? Who's saying, OK, you've gone down this path because of this, this and that, and starting to put things in place from there? It's not happening. Social services were telling me you can't let your son out because you can't protect him. So what are you going to do? I've been protecting him. However... He was just standing at the bus stop, minding his own business. So what I'm currently hearing from our children on the street is this person, this young boy was around for several weeks, terrorizing children. The children didn't tell anybody, they told each other. They didn't tell their parents, they didn't tell a youth worker, they didn't tell a teacher, they didn't tell the police. So our children are left vulnerable going to and from school. And as far as I can, what they said to me is, miss, nobody cares. You're the only parent that we've seen step on the road for their child. We don't see anybody. So because they'd seen me around, they happily gave me everything. And I handed it over to the police and the police are still telling me, well, you know, if your son doesn't testify, then we might have to drop the case. How does that make sense? 